Good morning. I'd like to thank you for joining us here once again at the Greenbrier Church Online. You don't have to spend a whole lot of time around other people before you figure out that not everybody is going to share your values. What's important to you is not necessarily important to anyone else. For example, maybe you walk into the bathroom and the person before you has left their their towel on the floor and there's toothpaste all over the counter. You hate that. You can't understand why won't people clean up after themselves? Why won't they take care of their things? You get frustrated. Or maybe you're at work and you've been paired with somebody who has a different work ethic than you do. When you're hired, you're told your shift is from 9 to 5, so you get to work at 9. You take a 30-minute lunch break at noon, and at 5 o'clock, you leave. But your new partner, well, they get to work at 8.45. They work right through lunch, and they never leave before 5.30, and yet they're constantly making these passive-aggressive comments about how hard it is to find people with a good work ethic. Or maybe you sit next to somebody in class, and every Monday they show up talking about the wild party they went to that weekend, how much they had to drink, how many different people they've been with. Every week you get to hear about their latest adventures, and all you can think about is it sounds more like their latest disaster. We could probably go through example after example of how difficult it is to live in a world where Everybody has different worldviews, different values, different opinions, preferences, leanings. Every one of us believe that we're right and that everybody else is weird and they just need to grow up. But what happens oftentimes is we find ourselves becoming overly concerned with all of those little things and we allow the most important things to just kind of slide by. We're in a study of Peter's first letter. Peter has just finished establishing this foundation for people that are struggling. He reminds us of our identity in Christ. He reminds us of God's uncomfortable grace that leads us away from our own broken little kingdoms into his much greater kingdom. And he reminds us of the awesome and amazing gift of salvation that Jesus has offered every one of us. Now, We're going to pick up the text, and we're going to see that Peter's going to spend a little time clarifying our values. Not those little values that we get upset over. Peter's going to remind us about values that are significant and how they they shape our lives. So let's look at what he has to say. He says, Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but it was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, so your faith and hope are in God. The very first significant and life-shaping value that Peter wants to draw our attention to is the value of accountability. Peter says our father judges each man's work impartially, and one of the biggest lies that we have to deal with is this delusion that there are parts of our lives where we don't have accountability. We believe that there are areas of our lives, places that are private, where we can just kind of step over a boundary and it's not really going to make that big of a difference. Yet the truth is that every decision, every action, every seed that we sow is going to have to be harvested. Paul says it this way to the churches in Galatia, make no mistake, God cannot be mocked. What you give is what you get. What you sow, you harvest. Paul's pretty clear, whatever you do is going to have consequences. Jerry Barber used to tell me there are three laws to sowing and reaping. The first is that you always reap exactly what you sow. If you sow corn, you're not going to reap beans. Secondly, he said you always reap later than you sow. It might take a week, a month, or several decades, but you can be sure that what you sow is going to have to be harvested. You're going to have to reap it. And thirdly, you're always going to reap more than you sow. A single apple seed produces a tree that produces thousands of apples and tens of thousands of seeds. 
And yet we still have this delusion associated with sin because the time that we sin is often in private, in the dark. We believe that we can do this thing, go in this direction, step over this boundary, and as long as nobody knows about it, it's not going to make a difference. Yet just flip through the pages of your Bible and ask, what were Adam and Eve thinking as they ate that forbidden fruit? What was Cain thinking when he took the life of his brother Abel? What was David thinking when he raped Bathsheba? What were hundreds of people thinking when they thought, I can sin in the dark and not have to face the consequences? It's sad, but I've lost the ability to be amazed when I hear that somebody tried to look at sin and think that they could step over God's boundary and not have to face the consequence. But what's worse is I've lost the ability to be amazed in myself as well. That's why I believe this theology of accountability is so very important for us today. It's something that we can't ignore and we can't gloss over. You already know all too well that your enemy likes to whisper in your ear, just go ahead and do it. It's not going to make a difference. Nobody's going to know. It's going to be our little secret. I mean, who cares if you're mean to your wife in private? It's not going to make a difference. Go on and look at that pornographic website. It's not going to make a difference. Go ahead and share that little juicy bit of gossip. It's not going to make a difference. You know what? Go ahead and fudge just a little on that expense report. In the grand scheme of things, I mean, really? It's not going to make a difference. Peter's talking to suffering people, his brothers and sisters, and he needs them to know that our enemy, he's a liar. He's telling outright, outrageous lies. While our father is a gracious, loving, and kind father, Peter says he's also a righteous judge. And that judge is going to require you to give an account for every word, every thought, every action. There's going to come a day when we're going to have to give an account for how we chose to live our lives. Jesus warns us on Judgment Day that you will give an account for every idol, every throwaway word that you speak. Peter's calling us to live with this deep respect and awe for our Father, who's also our judge. We need to love God so deeply that we would never want to do anything that would displease Him or step over His boundary that's established for our well-being. I think this is a safe place where we can be honest and acknowledge that we're all broken. We're sinful people that continually struggle with our base nature. But we need to admit that we struggle to live with a holy sense of accountability. It's really easy to say that we fear God without actually living in fear of our awesome God. If we're going to do more than merely exist, if we're going to thrive in the midst of this suffering and pain in this world, we have to live with this awareness that we're accountable to God and to each other. Which sets us up for the second value, the value of the cross. Peter says, For you know that it was not with imperishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your fourth fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. We can only live lives of accountability when we understand the value of the cross. You see, it's the cross that declares that the most important thing in my life is my relationship with God. It shows our understanding that we were created for God's glory. We were created to love Him and to worship Him. The greatest dilemma in our entire life is our sin. The biggest problem is not physical poverty, it's spiritual poverty. It's the sin that separates us from God. The greatest gift that we can achieve in this life, it, it's not a new house or a new car or a, a big gift card from Amazon. The greatest gift we can receive is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace makes it possible for us to come to God and it's provided through the cross. Jesus is qualified to be our Savior because He's the perfect Lamb of God, complete without blemish, because in every situation, every location, is every word, every thought, every deed, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law. The reality of the cross is that God comes to us at our lowest, most most harrowing moments, and offers us love. That's not the theology that most of us believe. 
Most of us believe that we somehow have got to figure all of this out to crawl out of this hole that we dug for ourselves and grovel our way to the throne of God so that maybe we can just get a little bit of pity. Peter is, Peter is calling us back to a better understanding of the cross. You see, it's because of the cross we can have hope and faith. I believe it was Martin Luther who said, our worth before God is passive on our end. It's received and defined by faith in the unconditional, undeserved, and unexpected love from the divine. Basically, Luther is saying, the only thing that we can do is accept God's unconditional love, forgiveness, mercy, and grace. There's no work that we have to do on our end. God makes everything completely and finally right. Jesus says we live out our belief in that every moment of every day. The cross is proof that God loves each one of us with this overwhelming, extravagant love. God has already provided us all of the love that we need. And since we're all equally loved by God, we should willingly and extravagantly love and serve one another in our community. When we understand that everything between God and us is fully and finally made right, we have this freedom to turn away from ourselves and to turn outward towards our neighbors to love them. My fear is that too many of us have gotten this backwards. We falsely believe that we've got to jump through the hoop, or even worse, there's a whole lot of stuff we are not allowed to do if we're going to gain God's favor. And we end up going to bed tired each night, frustrated, because we're faced with our failures and what seems like other people's success. We all know people who seem to have their relationship with God all figured out. They never miss a church service. They always say their prayers. They don't cuss. They dress well. They live pious lives. They look like what we assume a Christian is supposed to look like. But Peter says, be careful, because if you're doing all that, you might be living an empty life handed down to you. You see, you just go through the motions when you're at a church building or around other religious folks, but get them out in the wild and something's going to happen. I mean, they love God, but they seem to have forgotten what it means to love their neighbor. They treat the waitress at the restaurant horribly. They talk about how poor people are just trying to take their money to buy alcohol. They, they leave their shopping cart in the middle of a parking lot because they can't be bothered to walk 15 feet and put it up. They cut in line, make snarky comments. They live their lives like everything needs to revolve around them. Their excuse is that they're just tired or not getting what they deserve or they feel slighted. But that's not really the truth. I know everything in your life isn't perfect. Your bills aren't all paid. You have issues that cause you stress. You face physical and uh, emotional suffering. But in the midst of all of this, Peter says, remember, you've been covered by the blood of Jesus. And since God has already taken care of our greatest need, we need to be able to find the emotional bandwidth to live like we are saved through the cross. We need to take some time to love others, to serve others, to model love in the model city. You see, every action that Jesus took, every conversation that he had, every choice that he made was all done with you in mind. Jesus came into our world and lived the life that we could not live so that through his righteousness, we would be declared righteous before God. Jesus was raised from the dead. He not only dealt with our sin problem, he conquered death that is a consequence of our sin problem. God glorified him. Jesus, who was humiliated here on earth, was raised to glory and is at this very moment sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf so that we could be gifted with faith that we could find hope in God. That's why we take time to gather around the table because Peter warns that if our hope disappoints us, it's because we have the wrong hope. We take the emblems, we focus on the bread and the cup because we're forgetful people. We need to be reminded from time to time of the hope that we have in Christ that doesn't disappoint. Peter's reminding us one reason that God established the Lord's Supper was so that his forgetful children could gather and take time to remember who we are in light of his love. 
Far too many Christians are living lives of emptiness. We're trying to survive on the cotton candy that the world has to offer while while our souls are yearning and craving and longing for something much more substantial. This is the empty way of life handed down to us from our forefathers. We try to put on a brave face and act like our lives are full and happy. And the truth is we're really just empty and miserable. Sour sisters, bitter brothers, critical Christians have all forgotten what it means to live lives in light of his love and forgiveness. That's why we gather at the table. Because that's where we find our value and our purpose. That's where we're reminded of the cross. At the table, we're being called to remember that we're accountable for our actions and that people often formulate their opinion of God based on what they see in the lives of his followers. The greatest witness that we can have in our community is to boldly live out our joyful thanksgiving for what God has done in our lives. So Peter leads us to the table. He reminds us what Christ has already accomplished for us, that Jesus shed his precious blood to purchase us out of our sin and to set us free. We've been redeemed. The Lamb of God paid the price for our sin. Peter's bringing us back to this doctrine of substitution. It's a practice that's seen all the way back in the Garden of Eden when God killed animals to provide clothes to hide Adam and Eve's nakedness. It was seen when God provided a ram in the bush to provide a sacrifice for Abraham instead of his son Isaac. It was seen in the Passover lamb that was killed as each Jewish household put the blood of that lamb over their doors to get out of Egyptian slavery. And it's seen in Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Peter made it clear that Christ's death, it was done by appointment, not by accident. And while we see the cross and we think that God allowed his son to be cruelly tortured and murdered, from our father's perspective, Jesus willingly laid down his life for sinners, only to be raised from the dead. So we gather at the table to meditate on the sacrifice of Christ and to be reminded that we can face the unpredictable, the uncomfortable, the unthinkable, and stand strong because we have Jesus Christ in our lives. And there's nothing in this world that will separate us from him. So this morning as we go to the table, we want to spend some time talking about and considering, are we being accountable to how we are living in the light of the cross? You see, Peter wants to remind us that we are accountable for the way that we live, and he wants to remind us of the value of the cross, which makes us uh, and offers us a life that's worth living here in this broken place. I hope that you have a wonderful time of conversation around the table. Remember that you're loved, and I hope that you go in peace. Have a great week. I look forward to seeing you very soon.